Yes, Fairwinds with an E, fairwinds.com. Okay, so if people want to get the updated information that you have uh, to get out to them, this way of sharing information, they can log on to your website and, and get that information from you. Right. Okay. So anyway, I just, just want to say from my perspective, writing about this, and we were actually at the receiving end of the tsunami. We operated out of the Santa Cruz Harbor, and 10 hours, 500 miles an hour later, we received the tsunami in the Santa Cruz Harbor. And on the West Coast, several other harbors suffered great damage. So, uh, But this is nothing compared to what is happening in Japan. So I want to thank you again for, uh, for bringing us this information. Hi, I'm Ernie Gunderson from Fairwinds. Little change of venue today. There's been some reports in the press about a hydrogen buildup inside the containment at Fukushima. And along with that hydrogen gas, there's a discussion that there's some radioactive isotopes that are in the containment that could only be caused by a fission. Well, I thought I'd simulate today what a hydrogen buildup inside a containment looks like. Now, we're going to use this bottle as a containment. And I'm going to generate hydrogen gas in this little flask. Those, um, those nails are coated with zinc. And I'll add some acid to the zinc. And we'll create hydrogen gas out this hose. Put the hose in the bottom of the bottle. And hydrogen, being lighter than air, is going to push all of the gas out of this bottle. We'll be left with a bottle full of hydrogen. All right, let's see what happens. This is something you, you shouldn't try at home. Um, I'm wearing gloves, and we've got a fire extinguisher in the corner, as well as bountiful water, just in case. Um, again, don't try this at home. All right, here's our beaker. And this is muriatic acid. And those bubbles are hydrogen gas bubbles. that are filling this containment, this bottle, with hydrogen. Now we're going to wait a little while here for this bottle to completely full. Again, hydrogen's lighter than air, so it's going to float to the top. And then it's going to gradually, gradually, gradually push all of the air out of this container. Now we've waited about four or five minutes. And this bottle should be filled with hydrogen gas. All those bubbles ran out that hose and filled this bottle with hydrogen gas. All right, I'm going to take the hose out and set the, um, the acid aside because the next part of this lab is inside the bottle. All right, now hydrogen gas is lighter than air. So we put it in the bottom, but there's no place for it to go at the top, so it's going to stay in there. It's not going to leak out. Well, now I've put a little hole in the top of this bottle. And I'm going to light it with a match. Now what's going to happen is you're going to be seeing a little tiny flame up here. And that's the hydrogen gas escaping. It's barely visible. And I'll try to enhance it in a minute. Now there's a little flame at the top of this. It's made of hydrogen gas, pure hydrogen gas. You can see I just lit this. You notice the bottle is not burning. It's just the very tippy, tippy top of this. That's hydrogen mixing with the oxygen in air, forming that flame at the very top of this bottle. Now,
The situation is not stable at all. That's a pretty incredible demonstration there. Well, that's, well, that's a hydrogen deflagration. And, that's uh, the smaller the of the two shockwaves. That's what happened inside unit one. The shockwave in okay. that soda bottle only traveled at the speed of sound. Fukushima 3 was a different kind of explosion. Was that, and, and was a detonation. Um, there was much more force in the explosion of Fukushima 3 than at Fukushima 1. But I wanted to show that because there's still a hydrogen buildup in the... Um, in these three containments. And the only reason they're preventing another explosion is because they keep pumping lots of nitrogen. The uh, visual that you had sent us, uh, Arnie, you know, the arrow with the, uh, the rubber on rack and that sort of stuff? Yes. Yeah. Um, now, that's, that's from the Unit 4 fuel pool. And it was taken... Um, at the worst of the conditions in Unit 4, when they just started to pump water into the pool. And I believe it shows that the very top of the racks were exposed to air. If you look at that whole clip, um, it's a TEPCO clip, you'll see the steam is coming up from what appears to be below the top of the racks. And I think that was a, uh, the cause of the, uh, the explosion in Unit 4, was the condition of the pool. We'll find out more about that in the next year or so when they can get in the pool and, and actually take a look. But uh, I made fuel racks for a living, and uh, uh, to me it looks like they were exposed to air, and air does not cool a nuclear fuel rack wow. very well. Yeah, how, how's seawater work for that? Seawater's worse. <laughs> no, I'm sure what sea water does. Especially bad for the seawater. <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder, you know, the, the thing that was amazing to me is here you've got, uh, when they started flooding the reactor with the, the seawater, and then the containment kind of device that they came up uh, with were those straw erosion control barriers that you I see on that. Caltrans using on the side of the hill to stop dirt from mm -hmm. sliding exactly. down the hill. What, was that actually something to do or was that just somebody's idea that we have to make it look like we're doing something? Uh, well, the salt water issue, um, you know, it was the last, no one, every engineer knows you don't put salt against stainless steel, especially if the stainless steel is at a thousand degrees or 500 degrees or something like that. It's very dangerous. But they knew they had to because they had no other choice. Mm. Uh, and the, in the chain of command, the, the plant manager at Fukushima uh, wanted to do it. He asked his superiors and they said, no, don't do it. And he overrode his own superiors. And the plant manager, to my mind, is a hero because he overrode his superiors. He had to get water in or they would have had to evacuate the whole site. Uh, so if there's anyone who bucked the trend, it's the plant manager at Fukushima for, for basically telling the senior management that he wasn't going to do what they asked him to do. And he, he was down to his last card and he pumped the salt water in. Uh, a really brave man. Wow. I, you know, I, I want to come back. We didn't see the clip on data collection, but I want Dan to explain a little bit about what you guys do on the Sea okay. Odyssey with okay. the kids. And then I want you, Arnie, to explain um, what you've done with um, the data collection for Fukushima here. Okay. Well, what I want to do is um, direct uh, you to a couple of the pictures that we have up here of our program. And data collection is part of what we do. It's actually for educational purposes. We don't collect data for a marine laboratory. Uh, O'Neill Sea Odyssey is a youth science program. Uh, we serve around 200 schools a year. And uh, we serve mostly low-income youth. It's a free program. And one of the the core, the core of our program is plankton, which is, of course, the phytoplankton is the core of the marine food web. So when we, um, when we are out on the boat, we stop at three places, and we have three groups of kids. And um, I have another photo here of, um, of some work we do with navigation. So what we do is at each point, we uh, note where that point in the ocean was, and then we also collect plankton at that point um, with a plankton net. 
and each of these three groups will come back to our education center, which is at Santa Cruz Harbor, and we'll look at the plankton, uh, the density of the plankton, the types of plankton, and of course, this way the kids learn in a hands-on way about how things work in the marine food web with this being the base, how bioaccumulation works. In other words, if there are toxins, how they accumulate moving up the marine food web. It's a great science lesson. Um, but I think here, the kids are also learning the scientific methods. So things like collecting data uh, as a result of the Fukushima accident, for example, makes a lot more sense to them. And of course, they're doing it in an outdoor environment. The most important aspect of this is the ocean is the major feature on the planet Earth. It's integrated with our atmosphere. It's integrated with land, of course, in many, many ways. But the ocean is the largest feature. We know uh, relatively little about it. We do have to protect it. So to engender uh, the next generation of stewards, we have to teach kids about the ocean and how it operates. So our program is the core of doing that. We, we, we begin with that, and then the schools that use our program will use curriculum based on our program to integrate the ocean into the science lessons that the kids have. It's the large, world's largest science classroom. It's the world's largest science laboratory. Um, and the ocean is vast. Uh, it's a major economic uh, feature on our planet, too. It's how things move back and forth. We get a lot of seafood out of it, as we were discussing before. It produces half of the world's oxygen. It comes from phytoplankton in the ocean. Uh, so we do have to take care of it. And when little things like this happen, there is an impact. So the way we start is through teaching the kids about how, this, uh, about how the ocean operates and how we as individuals have an impact on it. Yeah, it's such a fantastic program, and I hope we get you out here to Santa Cruz at some point, Arnie, and uh, you and Maggie can come out and uh, take a look at the lab. We have a caller on the line, and I would like to get a question in from our caller, so bear with us for a moment, Arnie, and let, let's see how we can relay that. Hello, caller, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Do you have a question or a comment? I actually have two questions. Oh, fire I away. have one for Dan, which is, I wish I could go. <laughs> Your program sounds absolutely phenomenal. I wonder the age, uh, age bracket of children you take out. But really important for me is, yeah. is there anything like your program anywhere on the East Coast? I have a nephew who I would just love to get out there. Or do I have to fly him to California? <laughs> and then I have a question for Arnie, which is, I live in the high desert. Um, I don't live by Santa Cruz. I don't live on the coast. I don't eat fish. I am very concerned about Fukushima, of course. We all should be. But do you have any, any worries about airborne in the United States, in Canada, in other countries, um, contamination? Um, and B, I thought that cesium really wasn't too troublesome, but I guess I'm wrong on that. And I thought it, it, it went away very quickly, dissipated. And I, I'm thinking maybe I'm wrong on that. And um, besides fish, is there much concern? I know you said that in Japan they're finding higher levels in the rivers, where the rivers are running. But what about in our country or in other countries? Um, is much of this a concern from airborne contamination? And I'll listen on the internet. Thank you so much thank for you. thank you so much for the call. So we have a little bit of time here left, Arnie. We have two questions. Dan, I'll for the one. age bracket is fourth through sixth grade, uh, and depending on what part of the East Coast you're on, there are similar programs to ours. So how would you find those? Well, which best thing that she can do is email me. Just go on O'NeillCodyssey.org. Go to the contact section about the program and find my email, and I'll help you uh, locate those. Oh, awesome. Great. Arnie, are you still on? Uh, yeah, I'm still here. Great. Um, and did I, you hear the question, how, how do we track the, um, the spread of this? And if you don't eat seafood, uh, how are you liable to be impacted by it? Um, 